Hey, welcome back, First Assemblies, to our Wednesday night Bible study. And we will continue to go through the book of Mark. Um, we'll be in Mark chapter 6 today, where God takes on some unbelief. But let's recap a little bit of what um, we talked about last week. Last week in chapter 5, we've seen some incredible examples of faith through a woman of issue of blood who dealt with that for 12 years. And I can't imagine what she was going through. And... You know, the faith that she had, that she could just believe that if she could just touch the hem of his garment, that when she seen Jesus, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure she's heard the stories, but, and, and, and she was placed in a place, really it's an embarrassing position because she was considered unclean, and I can imagine her pushing through the crowds on her hands and knees, just trying to reach Jesus. I think she was very focused on, on the mission she had at hand. And, you know, can't, did the people say stuff to her? Hey, ooh, you're unclean, or get away from me, you know, don't touch me. And I think sometimes... We experience that even in, in today's world when, you know, when we see maybe someone who's just try, trying to come out of alcoholism or drugism or you know, whatever's going on in their lives, we, we look at them funny because these people were following Jesus and some of these people were followers of Christ already. And we need to be careful, though, when, when, when we see people go to the altar, we need to, pull, we need to, we need to surround them and love on them. But we know that she pushes past the crowds, that she looks past all the distractions and she grabs a hold of Jesus with her faith. And says, and, and remember, he said he stops. The whole crowd stops. And, and you know, your faith has made you well. And I think a lot of times people take that scripture, even what Jesus had said, and they really run with it, and they can run wild with it. You know, it, it was, it was, it was an interesting, you know, how it was placed in the scripture because it's tied in with the next guy too, with Jairus. Remember, Jairus was a synagogue ruler who came to Jesus with great urgency. So. You know, we, we first see Jairus first grabs a hold of Jesus, but yet, and then we see this woman coming in, like, kind of like the back door, kind of slowing the crowd down to get her healing. And, you know, and I, I, you can imagine as a father who ever had, uh, it's like a sick child, you know, I could see the urgency that was in Jairus. You know, my, door, my daughter's at death's door, Jesus, could you come, could you come to our house, could you heal her? And even through, during the slow progression of the crowd, you know, Jairus's faith had to grow. His patience had to be tested. And even when Jairus was told um, that his daughter had passed, Jesus says, don't be afraid, just believe. As, you know, and, and how many times of our lives, you know, can we relate to Jairus? Can we relate to the woman with the issue of blood? What is the importance of faith in your life? So I encourage you to kind of go back to the first five chapters that we've read. And I know sometimes we just like gloss over them and Go back and dig a little deeper and see what God's what God wants to say to you even more, that God will reveal to you even more. Even with this, his faith is a mystery. Think about this. We saw an incredible miracle in a man at the tomb who had uh, who had faith for him. Think about this. Who had faith for him? Was it the disciples? Were the people following Jesus? Because if you remember, they considered him helpless and hopeless and kind of like kind of like kicked to the curb like an old toy you know when you, you're, you're you, you can tell when you buy your kids toys and when they're done when they're done using the toys they cut the use out of it you know i can remember some of my kids with some of the toys they had we bought them stuffed animals when they were done with it it was all beat up and ragged sitting in a corner somewhere and they never didn't really play with it and you, you kind of get a sense of this man that they considered him you know what he's hopeless case why bother why try and help him but we have to understand that god with god and in god there's nothing that's hopeless. When, only when God says it's done, it's done. And we see that Jesus comes and he frees him and makes him whole. It's really an incredible story and a move of God's sovereignty that he just seen a situation that needed to be dealt with and he fixed it like that. So tonight we're going to look at faith once again, but if it was a coin, we're going to flip it over. We're going to look at what the other side is. What is the opposite of faith? It's really unbelief. So one side you have, we'll say you have faith, and then you have unbelief, or belief and unbelief. And we're gonna we're gonna read first in chapter six. We're gonna read first the first two sixes or the first six verses, and then we're gonna go back and kind of break it down, kind of the same way we've been doing. So let's go into uh, the book of Mark, chapter six. Verse one it says, "He went away from there, and he came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue." And many have heard and astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? 
Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joses, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own time, and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could not do mighty works there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. So let's pray real quick. Father, I thank you for your word and I thank you for your Holy Spirit. And I ask today, Lord, that your spirit would move in each of our lives, Father. Even tonight, Father, as we read your word, Lord, that you would break it down, Father, that we would understand what you're trying to say and what you were saying in, in, through Mark, Father, that we would understand it. And Father, that, Lord, you would breathe life into us, even now with your spirit, freshness, Father, and the Lord, that we would add all the distractions, Father, not hinder us, Father, but Lord, we ask that our eyes are focused on you and, and what you have to say this evening. We thank you in advance. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So let's go back to verse 1. It says, he went away from there and he came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. Now, Jesus is coming back to where he started his public ministry for most part. It was about a year before this event had happened in Mark 6, where Jesus was reading a prophecy from the book of Isaiah. It gave a Messianic prophecy. If you remember, whether you read it or you read it or you've seen it in a, in a movie, the prophecy related to the ministry of the Messiah. And when Jesus had, was done, remember, he rolled up the scroll, sat down, and began to teach and which was a typical action of, of a rabbi at that time. Now these words are fulfilled here, declared, and they freaked out because they knew that only the Messiah could say what he just said. Now if you remember, they tried, they got upset, and they tried to run him out of time. If you jump over to the book of Luke, uh, chapter 4, it says this, and starting in verse 16, And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, so in back to his own time, and as it was custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath and he stood up to read. And this is what he read. And this is why they got so mad. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given him and they unrolled the scroll and found it in place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has appointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. And he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering the sight of, to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant. And they sat down, and the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, understand where we're at. Now it's a year later, and Jesus is back in time. And we see in verse 2, we see him teaching, and yet, why are they allowing him to teach? Maybe they heard things. Maybe they were curious about him. It says, On the Sabbath he began to teach the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? And how much or how are such mighty works done by his hands? Now when you think about the word astonished, it's like marvel or amazed. But they begin to ask questions about him. Where did he get this wisdom or how are these works being done by his hands? See, much is believed that these people did not actually see him doing these miracles, but they really are questioning whether he really did them because... Even, even in this section, we read at the last verse, he had to leave because of their unbelief. And they even questioned him who he was. Because he said, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the, the brother of James and Josie and, and Judas and Simon? And aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. But they were continually asking questions. But it was interesting, when you look at the word offend or offense in the Greek, it, it comes from, we get the word scandal or scandal on or or a, a scandalize um, from this word. It means, I caused a stumble. It was a purposeful trying to stumble. And, you know, when you look at it here, it says how this word is carried here is the idea of placing something in the way of someone's path to trip them up. And it's interesting that the prophet Isaiah prophesied this 700 years earlier that Jesus would come, and Jesus did. He offended people. Isaiah 8, verse 14 and 15 says this, And he will become a sanctuary, a stone of offense, a rock of stumbling for both Israel, a trap and a snare for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. 
Even Paul quotes in Romans where it says the Jews thought they would they could be righteous by their own works, being good people, by following the law. And Jesus told them they couldn't do it that way. It would never happen. But they go on and say this in verse 3, Is not this the carpenter? Is this not the carpenter? It's really not a straightforward question as we, it appears. They're not asking if he's a carpenter. They know he was a carpenter. They knew he, he was a, Jesus was a Jewish carpenter. It was sarcasm. They were denying the claims that, that were being made about him. Now again, remember, no, Jesus, Jesus came back to his hometown. They only remembered him as a carpenter. It's been roughly a year had passed now, and he came with his disciples, and and people were following him, and they felt, well, really, is Jesus worthy of all those people following him? I guess a little bit of, you know, question came into mind, maybe a little jealousy. It's, it's almost like this, going to high school. Remember, remember in high school? And then you leave for a season in your life, and you, then you come back, and the people only remember you from where they last met you, remember? So, when, like, if, if I would go back to, say, my be my 40th, maybe 35th, you know, high school, I don't even think. But if I go back to my high school reunion, and, and this is the first time I've seen these people, saying over 35 years, 37 years, they would only remember what they remember me from high school. So maybe this is what's going on in their mind. But... I'm sure they got put off by all the entourage and the people that were following him. Carp right? Isn't he a carpenter? People just don't follow carpenters. You know, they're being very derogatory, and that what's that what makes Jesus feel that he can have an, an entourage. Wait a minute, Jesus? Wait a minute, he has no college, no academics. Wait a minute, he didn't graduate graduate high school. So it's kind of like that sense. Um, but the insult really does continue, in a sense, the, the barrage of the attacks. Because it goes on in that verse and says, The son of Mary, the brother of James, and Josie, and J Judas, and Simon, nor are not the sisters here with us. They took offense at him. Is this not the son of Mary? Now, when they said this, it was not being something very nice. They weren't asking in a nice way. They took Mary and they looked at her in a bad light because they knew that... Um, we know that she had the virgin birth through the Holy Spirit. We know that story about the virgin birth, but they think about it. people in the world don't understand. And they're looking at Mary being an un, at the time was an unwed woman who was pregnant at that time. And in Jewish culture, the reference, one would only reference a, a, a man's mother in case of insulting them. It was really a derogatory statement that they went against Mary and they went against Jesus. And they, they wanted to put that point across. To be normally respective in the Jewish culture at that time, with whether your father was alive or he passed away, they would say, oh, wait a minute, you're Mark, aren't you the son of James? You know, like, yeah, that's who I am. That's that's the, the respect, but they could not do that. So they said, they went at it in derogatory. But you have to ask yourself those, why were they offended? Nothing of what he had said or done would offended, could have offended anybody. But people get offended because they call him Savior at Christmas and Easter, right? Even the inference is that, think about this. When we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate the birth of our Savior. And then we celebrate Easter. We celebrate the resurrection of our Savior. But people think, wait a minute, why do I need a Savior? It infers them as sinners. People say, I don't need a Savior. You'd be amazed on how many people just get offended by just even Jesus' name. Because people know Jesus is the truth. They, they know that's real. He know, they know he's, the God, he's God. They, they know the whole story. They just don't want to face up and sit under his accountability and admit that they need a Savior. You know, and, it, and it's sad that some people just get caught up in all these other different religions to try to run from Jesus. But people, so, so we know, we all will stand before God. And we know that Jesus is saying, but people do get it. This is his mere name, Jesus. People get offended at it. And he continues, goes on and says in verse four, and Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor and except in his hometown among the relatives in his own household. So they refused to honor him and who he was. Even today, people refuse to honor God in his word. It's truth. You know, they just don't honor God anymore. They don't honor Jesus. They don't honor the Holy Spirit. You know, 
it, it, it's interesting to see the, the the way our culture is going and the, and the way our society is going um, that people are more accepting of other false belief, beliefs and religions whereas they don't want to know the truth verse 5 and it says he could do no mighty works there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and he healed them now if you and I think about this if you and I would lay hands on people we would consider that like astonishing, a mighty work. We look at it as, you know, it is amazing because it's not a common thing. But it, it's interesting when you think about it, it says and he could do no work, mighty works here except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. That it showed it was a natural thing for Jesus to do. We would be amazed but for Jesus, it was natural. Is Jesus trying to teach us it needs to be a natural thing for us to do also? See, their own belief limited what Jesus could do with only a few sick people. Their own unbelief caused the problem. You know, we've been hearing it. Let's see it. Kind of like adult. Okay, Jesus, now it's kind of prove yourself. You know, we, you, you know, we hear all these stories, but let's see it. it. There was a lot of doubt, a lot of condescending, a lot of a lot of uh, sarcasm, a lot of like, you know, go away kind of thing. We know they had a problem, but did they? That's the whole thing. That's that's what they need to focus on. Because in, even in Matthew chapter 13, verse 58, it says, And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So it's, it's written in several different Gospels. Even in 2020, when we look back in biblical days, why don't we see the same miracles happening now as we did back then? The, 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 the question here carries an inference. Perhaps they are not supposed to be going on anymore. Many Christians believe this. See, I don't. I believe that miracles happen every day. I believe, you know, what was done back then, and not everything, like but what the miracles, the signs, the wonders, what happened back then, still happen today um, people can say well I, I, I see it happen in the book of Acts but I don't see it today see the, the problem here is this that there's a lot of different teachings a lot of different things that, that, that we can get caught up in that are false but many believe that the miracles stopped back in what they call the apostolic era meaning when the apostles had died the miracles were over so that means when the last apostle died no more miracles does this teaching come from the Bible? Absolutely not. Uh, there is not one piece of evidence that suggests this, that miracles died out at the end of the apostolic era. The Bible never mentions that the apostolic era, that that term, apostolic era, was a man-made term made by man. But why do people believe this? Because they're basing this belief on their experience. They are doing what the people did in Nazareth. We hear about the miracles, but haven't seen them. And begin to call into question based on they don't see it going on. What's the problem here? They are the problem. Nobody asks then, even today, maybe the church doesn't have the power. It's because of the unbelief. Can a believer be overtaken with unbelief? Absolutely yes. You think about even that because man made up something. Oh, well, you know what? We believe because, you know, you get all these people, professors, and I'm not, I'm not saying, uh, I'm not doubting their education or anything like that. But you get all these people you get this, in these big conferences and they say, well, we believe that at a certain point that the canon of scriptures was closed, all these things that happened then would never happen again today. And that's absolutely wrong. Jesus still heals every day. Jesus still does miracles. He does signs. He does wonders. He still does it. And when the people are the ones that say, well, you know, this is because they're basing on seeing and believing. And that's dangerous for a Christian. How many times did Jesus rebuke his disciples for unbelief? Hard hearts. Is it our unbelief that is limiting the power of God to move to and fro in our lives and in today's church? Why do we blame God or 
or why do we blame God or because of a man-made calendar that said miracles stopped here look at all the possibilities that man stops from happening because of what they believe what they set up because of their man-made institutions unbelief is a constant danger for all of us Hebrews 3.12 says this, Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you fall, to fall away from the living God. Faith is needed today. Luke 18.8 8 says, I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, he will he find faith on this earth? Will I find faith or will he find unbelief? In verse 6 it says, An immoral because of their unbelief. What does it take to get God to marvel? Did you ever ask you that question? Well, obviously we know it's unbelief. Or it's belief. Think about this. There are two instances where God marveled in the scriptures. This is one of them. In his own time, and he marvels at their unbelief. If you remember the story of the Roman centurion, in Luke chapter 7, verse 8 through 10. It says, it says this, For I too am a man sent under authority and the soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turning to the crowds and fallen, saying, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. Think about that. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, and they found the servant well. A Gentile, a Gentile man sought out a Jewish Messiah. We see Jesus marveling over two instances of, of unbelief and the other of great faith. Marvel, I wonder. Why is it that Jesus is seeing this unbelief in his hometown and why are we and why are the people this way? And he goes on and says, and he went about among the villages teaching. See, our faith is under fire in this world, even ever before. Even in November, we must continue to see God move in our country. We, we need to. When, when he, whoever gets in the office in, in November as the president of our country, we need, to be, we need to be standing in faith. We need to see God moving. And even in many colleges, and our kids are, or many people or teachers, they're, they're, they're insulting the Bible even today, and their faith in God will be tested. There is a powerful movement in, the God, or in this country uh, to see our country flipped upside down and, and to be see our society secularized and 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 and, it, and it's and it's sad and, and is the church battling you know how many often do we see merry christmas was turned into happy holidays not about jesus but santa it's not up christmas is not about any kind of savior being born it's about a time to share love and gifts you know when faced in a world of filled with unbelief knowing that the unbelief is coming to get me. I need to be proactive, making sure my response to secularism, I need to face it head on. Listen, when you see a lot of a lot of these different things, when you go up to somebody at the register and say, Merry Christmas, or, um, and they say, well, Happy Holidays, um, and they say, well, we're just, we're just including New Year's with it. No, they're taking Christmas out because they were told to take the Christian... The Christian, the Christian holiday out. We need to guard our hearts. We need to feed our hearts and build our faith. We need to pray for God's love for our culture, but we also need to be prepared to show the hope that we have in Jesus. Why do you believe what you believe? See, don't get angry at people uh, for this, but we need to show this, the love of Christ to people. Our, our society is changing very rapidly, and, and to be brutally honest, if one group gets in, our country's going to change dramatically. Um, it, it's going to be it's going to be a total flip over, and we're going to see that happening probably this year. So, continually pray, and and when you see somebody with unbelief, share the story of your life so that maybe they have that belief. Maybe you can start working on them and leading them to Christ. Amen. Let's go to the next section, and we'll, we'll call the probably the quits this evening, and we'll just pick up next week with part two. Uh, Jesus sends out the twelve apostles, uh, verse seven through thirteen. Let's read it together. And he called his twelve and began to send them out two by two, and gave them authority over unclean spirits. And he charged them to take nothing on their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money, and their belts. 
but to wear sandals and do not put on two tunics. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, say to there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, they will not listen to you. When you leave there, shake off the dust off that's on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out to the proclaim the people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Imagine being one of them twelve going out two by two. So let's go back to verse 7, 8, and 9. It says, He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two, and he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. So it's interesting. You see him. He's just passing on what he what he just did. What he's been being what he's beginning to show them what to do. Now Jesus is saying, Okay, now you see me do it. Now it's your turn. Go do it. And he charged them to take nothing on their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but wear sandals and not put on two tunics. Now really think about this. These guys were going on short-term mission trips, if you really think about this. Now, when we go, I can remember going on a short-term mission trip. I went two weeks. And I remember my first one I went on, I packed so much stuff. The guys looked at me like, you can't take all this stuff. I'm like, why not? He says, because you just can't do that. And, you know, you learn how to cut down. But they weren't even allowed to take anything extra. Even, like, the extra um, tunic they could probably think of as a blanket. You know, if you have an extra tunic, you could, if you're laying down and it gets cold, you throw a blanket on, you're warm. Not for this mission's trip. You know, you have to ask yourself, okay, Jesus, why are you asking him to do this task? Because, listen, when those guys went out, it was all about them depending on God. Because they're going to they're gonna encounter many different situations. Yeah, we do the same thing. We go on a mission trip. But how, how would it have been if, if you were only allowed to take the clothes on your back. Oh, well, if you leave a country, a passport. And that's it. And you're relying on God to make sure that whenever you get to the destination you go to, that the people there will take care of you. Or give you food, give you shelter. If you need, if you need clothes or a blanket or something because it's cold, they'll give it to you. They will encounter many situations where God must be in the forefront, depending on God. So when they get there, they have to be doing ministry. Proverbs 3, verse 5 through 7 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean on in your own understanding. In all your ways, excuse me, acknowledge Him and He, He, it says He, will make straight your path. Be not wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and turn away from evil. God places them in a place to rely on God and God alone. And we say, in our lives, we can say this, God, you're faithful. God, you're so great. You're so awesome. But when we have to be, when we have to have actually have to put our faith to the test see it in action here you see the disciples they're believing god we trust you lord you're the best we're going to follow you everywhere and boom he goes okay you 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 pulls you know pulls them together six sends out six couples here you go and they he wanted them to be in a place where they trusted on him now why did he go by one by one or two by two well that's just common one you can tell guys accountability uh one you can like lift them up uh, there's a couple different reasons why we he sent them out by twos, but to care, you know, to lift like I said, lift each other up, care for each other, help each other, uh, encourage each other. Because sometimes when you go on those mission trips, they're tough, man. This is where God just starts to strip some stuff off your life. You go on a mission trip, don't go on a mission trip thinking it's a vacation. But although there are some people do go out and, and it's like a vacation to them, but it's not meant to be that way. I mean, my first one, we were sleeping on the floor in the grind. You know, and the, and the greatest you know thing you're worried about is getting a bug in your ear. You know, what I mean, that's I mean that's just truth. Um, but like nowadays, they stay in hotels or they're, they're having dinners and lavish stuff. Well, you know, when we went, I'm not saying it's tough. Not it's not not tough now. I'm not saying it. When we went, it was hard. It really it really stretched me. It really it really it stretched me in many different ways. So hats off to those who do missionary work um, in, in foreign lands. Where you know their lives are threatened every day, um, where they're trusting God every day. Hats off to you, uh, compliments, kudos. But you know this scripture can be very scary if you if your walk with God is not so good though. Also, think about this. You know, it's it, it puts you in a place where you're trusting, relying on God. In verse ten and eleven it says, and he said to them, "Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place you will not receive you." And they will not listen to you when you leave. Shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. 
listen, we're going to face so many people uh, who have really have hard hearts, and, and, and God has given us the freedom to reject them. Listen, they're not rejecting you or me. They're rejecting God. Um, but understand, if people, when people hear the Word of God, and they reject Him, Listen, it doesn't mean they won't have to face the consequences of rejecting Jesus. They will. They will deal with it. You know? It's almost like if you think about a story about, a, you know, you're in, an, you're in the ocean and you're drowning. And all of a sudden, you, someone throws a life preserver. You know? And it's, it's just, Jesus is our life preserver. Um, you're free to reject the life preserver. But you'll experience that rejection. It's just truth. It's, not, it's just the word of God saying it. So verse 12 and 13 says, So they went out and proclaimed that the people should repent. And they cast out many demons, anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Jesus has given them the opportunity to experience ministry for themselves. If you ever, if you never experienced ministry for yourself, I, I, I challenge you to go out and, and, and try. Go out. It, it's hard. Start with your family first. Uh, start at your church somehow. But get out and start ministering to people, praying for them, laying hands on them, and, and, and believing for them, and encouraging and lifting them up. These guys were very interesting. But think about this. He just remember Jesus goes and he picks his twelve. He raises them up. They didn't have it all together, but Jesus knew their hearts and gave them the authority that He had. It's a reminder for you and me that through the power of the Holy Spirit and under the authority of Jesus Christ. We are sent out like them to do what he called us to do. And as Christians are, we are given are we given all authority though? You know, we can we can think about that. He gave these guys authority to do what he had asked. Jesus gives us authority to do what he has asked. You know, even like when you think about authority, authority covers a multitude. Remember when Jesus says in Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20, the Great Commission, he says, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth have been given to me. God, the Son, listen, has complete authority and given by God. Now he gives it to the church. Now go therefore, make disciples of nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end, and end of this age. I'm having a dry mouth. But, um, listen, he says, listen, you have all the authority you need. I'm giving you that authority. In a general sense, the church has been given the authority to do several things. Make disciples of all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, and he says one thing, I will be with you always, even into the end of age. Now, I think where... Authority, though, is there are sometimes people usurp their authority. Like, because people don't, when I said earlier, all authority, when we say all authority, though, it's in a general sense, kind of like what they said in Matthew. But there are times that authority are given to certain people, whether it's discern or, um, not discern, prophetic words. Um, even when Ephesians talk about, in chapter 4 of Ephesians, uh, verse 11 and 12, it talks about, and, te and he gave authority, or he gave the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry to build another body. Oh, those guys, whoever the, the, the he, they're, they're called the, the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers, there is a different authority given to them. Why? Because that's the job that they're doing. So if someone's an evangelist, there's an authority given by God to that person to be the, the evangelist. There's an authority for someone to be a prophet or a shepherd. You know, you know what I mean? To do the work of the, the, of the ministry. But there are things in the body of Christ that a person can do, but we, but we don't have authority to do most of it. And that's what I'm talking about here. There are giftings and areas of our lives where we have to allow others to take. That is their giftings. You know what I mean? That means that God is has blessed them and given them authority to do that in certain areas. So sometimes we have to take a step. Hey, wait, that's not my gifting. That that's not my authority and that's that's for something we need to allow other people to do that. You know? Even when like I just mentioned, there you know, there are some out there who are gifted as teachers. That's their and God's given them authority to teach. There are some out there that are extra or just great evangelists. That's you know, there are people that have been in authority to be a 
uh, children's minister or youth leader. You know, we think it's all blended together. Everybody can just do everything they want to do, and it's that's not what it is. When you're called to do something, then with that calling, God gives you that authority. You have the authority. But generally, we have the authority of a child of God. We just have to know that we don't step beyond what our authority is given through Jesus Christ. Amen. To understand that these guys went out and he he allowed them to have the ministry that he has been showing them for, for, for the time that they were with him. And now it's time and for us, as we read God's word, you know, we're grafted in the divine. We're, we're believers in Christ. Um, do we have the authority to do certain things? You know, um, what has God given us authority to do? What, you know, because sometimes, you know, you see people, they go out and they try to pray over, pray people, maybe have a demon, and it didn't work. Did God give you the authority to do that? And there's there's a lot of people that will fight about that and complain about that and, and argue about that. But understand, what is our authority? And we see that, that God had given him authority to do that, what he was doing, and um, they did it. Can you imagine him coming back then when he talks to them? But we'll, 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 we'll pick up with this next week. We'll start off with uh, uh, chapter or verse 14 of um, Mark chapter 6 with the death of John the Baptist. Um, so let's pray. Father, we thank you for, for this evening. And, and Lord, we thank you for your word. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that your word is alive. And Father, it brings light and hope and encouraging words to us, Father, even when we're down, Father. And even today in our society, Father, that, Lord, we do have authority over the thoughts that come into our minds. We do have authority in what the things that come out of our hearts, Father. I pray, Lord, that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable to you, my Lord, my Redeemer. I pray, Lord, that you would move powerfully through our lives, Lord, and that we would walk in authority in those spiritual battles that we face. Lord, that we would put on the full armor of God over our over our lives and over our family and over our friends, Father, that, Lord, that as we go out to minister the gospel, as we walk in your authority, Father, that we would see many people set free. I thank you in advance for what you're doing. And, Lord, I ask that you would just continually breathe life into our homes, our lives, and our futures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Be blessed. And I ask, go back over and reread some of the places that we kind of glossed over and see what God wants to tell you as you take your private time with God and see what He reveals to you and maybe places in your life. Be blessed. Have a good evening. Bye now.